John Busby with the Culture Buzz, and joining him in the studio right now is uh, a filmmaker, a very creative spirit, and a good buddy in the cinematic mischief category. Uh, he's been achieving, or I've been just kind of believing, I guess. I don't know what that means, but it means that uh, Mark Hagen is in the studio, and we're going to be talking, kind of get an update about the Lost Cinemas of Greater Des Moines. It um, is an exceptional documentary. Um, I can brag on a little bit because I don't want to, you know, have Mark do his aw shucks and get all blushy on me and stuff like that. But um, uh, yes, at my behest, uh, Mark and his producer, producer Sarah Ultrogi, uh, submitted uh, their documentary to The Wild Rose. Well, The Wild Rose had almost 500 films submitted, of which only 45 made it to the screening part of The Wild Rose. And we had a ton of exceptional documentaries. Um, and, uh, well, long story short, your years did make it into the festival, Mark. <laughs> As you know, not only that, it won awards and... Uh, the coup de gras is that it became the audience favorite. It won the best audience award, which <laughs> the shock things that. here. Is, obviously, he doesn't visit the Wild Rose website because um, we counted up the uh, tallies. Uh, it took us several days after the festival was over. We could announce it at the awards because the festival was still going on. But yes, Lost Cinemas of Greater Des Moines became the audience choice uh, for the 2013 Wild Rose Independent Film Festival. My gosh, thank you, Wild Rose. <laughs> Don't thank me. Thank, <laughs> thank the fact that uh, Des Moines audiences say, you know, I like this documentary. I want to see it. Some people had seen it before, but it's kind of in a whole new state now, which is just gorgeous. And you had a ton of people come out there just because, one, I think the greater Des Moines area loves good documentaries. And two, if you have a good documentary that's also based on history of our community, it's almost like, uh, duh. <laughs> well, I think what we're finding out about Des Moines is that uh, d despite its modesty, Des Moines really does love its own history. If you've been on Facebook at all and seen Lost Des Moines, that's got over 10,000 members now. And I have a feeling that maybe uh, a lot of Lost Des Moines members might have shown up uh, because it was a pretty enthusiastic audience. Um, well, it, it was enthusiastic for several good reasons. And it's something I've been speaking, since, speaking about since... Uh, um, you weren't present, but we had a screening of kind of the rough cut, the original rough cut. What was it, about October of 2012 or 11? Probably 2011. 2011, that's when it was. And it, there was a small group of people, maybe about 20 people at most, that uh, came by the State Historical Building for a screening. And uh, I heard this name, Mark Hagen, and I talked to Sarah. I've known Sarah for a long time. And said, who is this guy? This is a fascinating piece of film. And so we got connected and uh, we started forming a friendship and he's back in Des Moines now. And now he's able to say that um, not only was it audience uh, choice award, but it was uh, selected as winner for the best documentary feature film. Uh, and that is no small feat. Uh, trust me when I say that the Wild Rose uh, screening process uh, is intense. It's a blind judging process, so it's not like I could kind of exact any kind of leverage because Mark's a good buddy or anything like that, but um, uh, it's just neat. Um, the elements about this film, and I'm, I'm gonna ask you kind of a two-part question here, Mark, because I want you to kind of give something out there for people to kind of start wrapping their brains around because there might be ways to eventually get a copy of this documentary. One, how did the concept come about? And two, what is your background for being able to work with the content that you researched and put it into the film? Because it's not like, oh, I'd like to do this. No, you actually have a good body of work to back up your skill and craft in this film. Well, to answer the first part of your question, uh, it started before I even moved away from Des Moines. And the way it started is pretty much the way I describe it in the film. I was literally driving around downtown and noticing, well, gee, this, this building looks like it used to be a movie theater, and that building looks like it used to be a movie theater. And then I made a list, and it just got my curiosity going, and it snowballed, and I researched things. And even after I moved to California, I kept... Uh, 
adding more and more pictures to my collection, and, and, and I thought, well, this might make a really great book because uh, there's so much visually interesting material that, that there is. It's, it was just a matter of digging it up because it hasn't been gathered together in any one place. Um, so I, originally it was going to be a book, but then uh, I wound up working at Technicolor in uh, the early 2000s, and I started learning animation as part of my job. Uh, I made a lot of DVD menus. Uh, f for which I would animate things in After Effects. So I got pretty good at After Effects and Photoshop. And then uh, I, I started thinking, oh my gosh, I would love to do something more with Lost Cinemas rather than just make a book or have a collection of pictures. And I thought, wouldn't it be great to see what these photographs would look like as film? And as it turned out, a lot of the film I shouldn't say a lot. <laughs> what little of the film of the, the movie theaters in Des Moines that was left was pretty much melting away. Uh, a lot of it was shot on nitrate, which, as people may or may not know, is very explosive and dangerous. And even if it doesn't explode, it sort of melts into goo. And I, I found some interesting pieces that were in film vaults in California that we couldn't use because they were melting away. Um, so it wound up being sort of a necessity that I, that I animate these photographs just to make it a little more immersive and not just a series of uh, photos. Interesting. I, and, and this is one thing that um, uh, I think it, when you think of history in general, uh, I don't know if enough people realize the sense of urgency. And it's not just in film. It's with uh, documents and everything else. Uh, we are losing our history at an alarming rate. And I know that there's a big movement in the film industry to capture at least some of the major movies, but there's some archival stuff, some behind the scenes stuff and newsreel stuff that uh, for me, that's some of the real meat and taters of what needs to be saved. And, and this is kind of, it, 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 this is a microcosm, Lost Cinemas of Greater Des Moines, a microcosm of that because you're sharing this history and you have captured a lot of it. And so it's in now a format or almost in a format that we can share. Now, the reason I said almost in a format, folks, um, uh, you can go online. I encourage you to get connected with Lost Cinemas of Greater Des Moines. There's a Facebook presence there, very active. There is a website, lostcinemas.info, I-N-F-O. You can go there. And what I'm getting at is that this has been a, a labor of love, uh, and it's a costly labor of love because it takes an awful lot to not just create the product, but also to secure rights. And this is one thing I'm just going to kind of toss a pledge out there, a little bit of a challenge. If you love uh, what this film history here in Des Moines means, what the film business means now and into the future for you, I encourage you, find a way to throw a little support toward Lost Cinemas because they're still trying to secure those last rights so they can complete the DVD and release it uh, for sale publicly. And uh, so that's, that's my shameless plug so that Mark doesn't have to say it. Uh, he would say it, but it's easier for me to say it because... Um, uh, that's just the way the culture buzz is. I believe in saving the good cultural assets we have and getting them out there, and this is how you can make sure it gets out there. So I'm sure they're doing up some way that you can be acknowledged and everything else. Um, but I don't know, are there any, I, I know that the one thing, you've got the, the, the film to the point where it can be shown at some select film festivals. Yes. But that's a it, it's that's uh, still a big step away from being available to the general public. What we're looking towards is a commercial release, and we want to do it in two phases. We want to do uh, a short theatrical run next spring around the state. Uh, and as we've seen at the Wild Rose, it does blow up nicely on the big screen, so I think it'll be something that people will want to see that way. And then, of course, we want to do a DVD a home video release so people can keep it and hopefully pull it out once in a while to enjoy again and again. And sort of the crown jewel in the film, at least in my opinion, is in the very center of the film, uh, we've got some some footage from uh, the old Fox Movie Tone News Library, which is uh, of the world premiere event for the 1945 version of State Fair. Uh, which is the one that had uh, Dick Hames in it. And it was a huge event. It, it 
it was sort of a double premiere. It premiered at the Des Moines and the Paramount side by side on Grand, where the convention center is now. And it was a it was a day long event where they had uh, live broadcasts, and uh, the movie stars came in by train. They had a large party here at the very hotel Fort Des Moines in which we're sitting, and uh, huge event. And Fox came in, filmed the whole thing. Uh, it was a one minute newsreel that aired aired that played in theaters. Uh, in 1945 and then wasn't seen again. Uh, now along with that newsreel were about 20 minutes of outtakes. So it turns out that Fox still had this material, so I got a hold of a, a demo version of it, uh, used the whole newsreel, but then sort of lengthened it by uh, carefully editing together a lot of these outtakes because there were so many interesting things in them that just there wasn't room for in, in the one minute that they had. So what I'm trying to say here is that this was sort of the peak of movie going in Des Moines and it was a huge event. It's something that most people aren't even aware ever happened with thousands of people in the streets, uh, movie stars, giant crowds, uh, amusement park rides up and down Grand. And I think people really need to see this. And uh, the thing is, is it costs a lot of money to get the rights for this. It's uh, I think it's around $47 a second, if I remember correctly, and we're using just a little over two minutes. So for home video and theatrical rights for this two minutes of footage, two min for this two minutes of footage, we need uh, around $5,500, which <laughs> sounds like a lot for two minutes, although in the in the film world, it's not really that much, and we've been fortunate enough to have a lot of public domain material and donations from people with great material but this is one that we're going to have to pay for and I really don't want to cut it so I want to make sure that it comes out with this fantastic scene in the middle of it. Well if, if uh, there is an opportunity in some kind of uh, sneak preview screening or at a film festival screening to see this I encourage you to do so. Uh, and, and get in touch on Facebook. Mark is a sociable kind of guy. He'll talk back with you and he'll uh, explain the situation. But it is worth it uh, because this footage is just so absolutely unique and it really does cement that particular moment in cinematic history in Des Moines, Iowa. Uh, it, it reverberated across the country and then some. Uh, and here it was. We were the epicenter, which is kind of cool to think about. It is. We had the, the fifth theater in the country that was devoted exclusively to movies, and that was the uh, the Bijou in the Nickel Dome, same place uh, that is right next to the Equitable Building. The, the bare bones of the building are still there. Uh, they're remodeling it now for some new purpose, but uh, that was the fifth theater in the country. Uh, oftentimes it was a vaudeville house where they would also show movies, but this one was built to show just movies, and that was because it was at the end of a trolley stop. And A.H. Blank, uh, who most people know for his philanthropy, he was he was the kingpin of uh, the Des Moines theater scene. He had actually read an article in the paper about Thomas Edison inventing movies, and so he took a train out to New Jersey to meet him and find out what it was about, and then he was all excited and came back and borrowed some funeral parlor chairs and started that first theater on Locust. <laughs> you know, that, that just kind of blows my mind in such a wonderful way because there in just a couple of short sentences, all of a sudden Des Moines, the movie industry, one of our leading philanthropists here in the city of Des Moines connects with Thomas Edison. And uh, it's just like, whoa. Uh, but it did happen here, and um, that's one of the many things that uh, your film so magnificently unfolds and presents is the importance of some of the players right here in Des Moines and some of the theaters right here in Des Moines had in the industry itself. I mean, uh, some of the uh, foundation-shaping things that happened here really helped uh, Hollywood become Hollywood. That's true. And in fact, I, I picked up a new story as I was having lunch at uh, the Smokehouse in Burbank with A.H. Blank's 
I believe it was his great grandson, uh, Austin. We were having lunch there, and he, he nodded his head towards the window, and he said, "Well, A. H. helped start that studio," and he was nodding his head towards the Warner Brothers studio across the street, and <laughs> that turns out to be true. Uh, a. H. and a number of other exhibitors put together First National Pictures, which is what Warner Brothers was before it was the Warner lot. It was it was a smaller studio with about four sound stages and some offices, all of which are still there today. I've been to them many times. Uh, and it turns out that uh, this was also kind of a pioneering thing because the, the movie studios were starting to get into exhibition, and so this was their revenge against the studios. It's like, well, if they're gonna exhibit, why don't we make movies? And so they put their money together and started that, and they were a big success. They got Charlie Chaplin and Mary Pickford and uh, Pola Negri. And uh, <laughs> then it t things took off, and then they were big enough that Warner bought them, and uh, you know, it's a big part of Hollywood history that, that many people probably don't know about. Well, uh, uh, you have done a wonderful job. This is such a content wrench documentary that it deserves to get out there to the world. And this is where you folks out there can be part of that process. I do heartily encourage you uh, to uh, get involved with the Lost Cinemas of Greater Des Moines and help underwrite and secure those rights for those special scenes because that's what Mark is talking about. He's investing his time. He's not pulling a salary from this at all. Uh, everything that he gets goes directly toward those rights costs. And that's what it amounts to is once that's secured, then the film as it's really meant to be seen in, in its entirety will be there for you to enjoy and for you to share with other people. In fact, you can even kind of give them a little soft nudge as you're eating your popcorn and watching and saying, you know, I actually helped make this happen. That would be kind of neat. Mark, thanks so much. As always, you're fascinating. Uh, get engaged with Lost Cinemas of Greater Des Moines. Get on Facebook uh, and uh, connect with them that way because that way as new things come up, uh, you'll be the first to know what's happening, but you can become one of the ever-increasing throng of fans of, of Lost Cinemas of Greater Des Moines uh, as uh, created by Mark Hagan. Uh, I will let you, there, there's some other folks we should uh, acknowledge because uh, really uh, you, had to been prop, you had to have been propped up by some other people to get it to this point. Luckily I was. It was uh, I did so much work myself for so many years and then uh, I met Sarah Oltragi and she unearthed a treasure trove of photographs that I hadn't been able to find and that took the film up a whole notch and, and got us some great material. Uh, and she did a little bit of rewriting, which was also very helpful. She's a great writer. Uh, then when I moved back to town, I met Brian R. Johnson of Johnson Brown Editing. And not only is he a great editor, but he is also uh, a primo sound designer and music supervisor, music editor. And he took my fairly shambled together soundtrack and spit polished it into something that is just wonderful to hear. When we were at the Fleur for the Wild Rose, it was just great hearing that coming out of those speakers. So thank you, Brian. Thank you, Sarah. You guys really helped make Lost Cinemas the, the nice thing it is to see and hear today. And it was fun from my perspective just to see this smile not fading one lick from Mark's face long past when the final credits have already run. So uh, get engaged with this. It's going to be a fun project to keep following, and it's one that uh, just shows that uh, the homegrown creativity uh, delivers stuff that not only is great for our community. One of the ongoing things I heard from many people is that, you know, you don't have to be from Des Moines or even Iowa to appreciate this story. This is well-crafted history and told in such an engaging fashion that everyone's got to see this. So get yourself engaged uh, with this uh, documentary. After all, it is... Uh, the best of when it comes to feature length documentaries. It also is the audience choice. So I think that's cool. Much continued success, Mark. And uh, so always feel free to give a holler when you're ready to update us more. But uh, if you start a campaign, then, well, heavens, we'll even help kick it off here. All right. Thank you so much.